begin in May. In May, the weather became uncommonly mild and pleasant, and so forward was the vegetation that I picked a plenty of strawberries by the middle of the month. Of this fruit, there are great quantities on this coast, and I found them a most delicious treat. My health has now become almost re-established, and my wound being so far healed that it gave me no further trouble. I had never failed to wash it regularly once a day in sea water to, uh, to dress it with a fresh leaf of tobacco which I obtained from the natives who had taken it from the ship but made no use of it. This was all the, the dressing that I gave it, except applying to it two or three times a little loaf of sugar which Makina, the chief, gave me in order to remove some proud flesh which prevented it from closing. My cure would doubtless have been much sooner effected had I had been in a civilized country where I could have had it dressed by a surgeon and properly attended to. But alas, I had no good Samaritan with oil and wine to bind up my wounds, and fortunate uh, might I even esteem myself that I was permitted to dress it myself for the most utmost that I could effect from the natives was compassion for my misfortune, which I indeed experienced from the women particularly the queen, or favorite wife of Makina, the mother of Satsatsosis, who used Frank frequently to point to my head and manifest much kindness and solicitude toward me. I must do Makina the justice to acknowledge that he always appeared desirous of sparing me any labor which he believed might be hurtful to me. Frequently inquiring after an affectionate manner in my head injury, whether or not it pained me. And as for others, some of the chiefs accepted, they cared little what became of me and probably would have been gratified with my death. My health being at length re-established and my wound healed, Thompson, who you remember, my shipmate who survived with me, became very importunate for me to begin my journal. And as I had no ink, proposed to cut his finger to supply me with blood for the purpose, whatever I would, whenever I would want it. On the 1st of June, I accordingly commenced a regular diary, but I had no occasion to make use of the expedient suggested by my comrade, having found a much better substitute in the expressed juice of a certain plant which furnished me with bright green color, and after making a number of trials, I at length succeeded in obtaining a very tolerable ink by boiling the juice of the blackberry with a mixture of finely powdered charcoal and filtering it through a cloth. This I afterwards preferred or preserved in bottles and found it answerable very well. So true is it that necessity is the mother of invention. As for quills, I found no difficulty in procuring them. Whenever I, or whenever I wanted, the crows and ravens with which the beach was almost always covered, attracted by the offal of the whales, 
and the seals, etc., and which they were very so tame that I could easily kill them with stones, and while a large clam furnished me with an inkstand. The extreme solicitude of Thompson that I could and that I should begin my journal might be considered as singular in a man who neither knew how to write or read, a circumstance, by the way, very uncommon in an American, where we were less acquainted with the, the force of habit, he would have been for many years at sea and accustomed to consider the keeping of a journal as a thing indispensable. This man was born in Philadelphia and at eight years old ran away from his friends and family and entered as a cabin boy on board a ship bound to London. On his arrival there, finding himself in distress, he engaged as an apprentice to a captain of a collier or a coal ship. From thence he was impressed on board an English man of war and continued in the British naval service about 27 years, during which he was present at the engagement under Lord Howe with the French fleet in June of 1794, and when peace was made between England and France, was discharged. He was a very strong and powerful man, an expert boxer, and perfectly fearless. Indeed, so little was his dread of danger that when irritated, he was wholly regardless of his life. Of this, the following will furnish a sufficient proof. One evening, about the middle of April, as I was at the house of one of the chiefs, where I had been employed on some work for him, word was brought me that Makina was going to kill Thompson. I immediately hurried home, where I found the king in the act of presenting a loaded musket to Thompson, who was standing before him with his breast bared and calling on him to fire. I instantly stepped up to Makina, who was foaming with rage, and addressing him in soothing words, begged him for my sake not to kill my father, and at length succeeded in taking the musket from him and persuading him to sit down. On inquiring into the cause of his anger, I learned that while Thompson was lighting the lamps in the king's room, Makina having substituted ours for their pine torches, some of the boys began to tease him running around him and pulling him by the trousers, among the, roast, the most forward of whom was the young prince. This caused Thompson to spill the oil, which threw him into such a passion that without caring what he did, he struck the prince so violently a, a blow in his face with his fist as to knock him down. The sensation excited among the savages by an act which was considered as the highest indignity and a profanation of the sacred per person of the majesty. It may be easily conceived. The king was immediately acquainted with it who, on coming in and seeing his son's face covered with blood, seized a musket and began to load it, determined to make 
and take this instant revenge on the, the audacious offender. And had I arrived a few minutes later than I did, my companion would certainly have paid with his life for this rash and violent conduct. I found the utmost difficulty in pacifying Makina, who for a long time after could not forgive Thompson, but would repeatedly say, John, you die, Thompson, kill. But to appease the king was not all that was necessary. In consequence of the insult offered to their prince, the whole tribe held a council at which was unanimously resolved that Thompson should be put to death in the most cruel manner. I, however, interceded so strenuously with Makina for his life, telling him that if my father was killed, I was determined not to survive him, that he refused to deliver him up to the vengeance of his people became the case, saying that for John's sake they must consent to let him live. The prince, who after I had succeeded in conning his father, gave me an account of what had happened, told me that it was wholly out of regard to me, as Thompson was my father, that his life had been spared, for that if any one of the tribe should dare to lift a hand against him in anger, it would most certainly be the fact that he would be put to death. Yet even this narrow escape produced not much effect on Thompson, or induced him to restrain the violence of his temper. For not many weeks after, he was guilty of a similar indiscretion in striking the eldest son of a chief who was about 18 years old, and according to their custom, was considered as a Tai or chief himself, in consequence of his having provoked him by calling him a white slave. This affair caused great commotion in the village, such the tribe was very clamorous for his death. But Makina would not consent and I used frequently to demonstrate with him on the imprudence of his conduct and <laughs> beg him to govern his, his temper better, telling him it was our duty, since our lives were in the power of these savages, to do nothing to exasperate them. But. All I could say on this point availed little, for so bitter was the hate that he felt for them, which he was no way backward in manifesting both by his looks and actions, that he declared he would never submit to their insults, and that he had much rather be killed then be obliged to live among them, adding that he only wished he had a good vessel and some guns, and he would destroy the whole of the cursed race. For to a brave sailor like him, who had fought the French and the Spaniards with glory, it was a punishment worse than death to be a slave to such a poor, ignorant, despicable set of beings. As for myself, I thought very differently. After returning thanks to that merciful being who had in so wonderful a manner 
so softened the heart of the savages in my favor, I had determined from the first of my capture to adopt a conciliating conduct towards them uh, and, and conform myself as far as was in my power to their customs and mode of thinking, trusting that the same divine goodness that had rescued me from death would not always suffer me to languish in captivity among these heathen. When, with this view, I sought to gain their good will by always endeavoring to assume a cheerful countenance, appearing pleased with their sports and buffoon tricks, making little ornaments for the wives and children of the chiefs, by which means I became quite a favorite with them. And fish hooks, daggers, etc., for all the others. As a father recommended to uh, their favor, and what might eventually prove to the most importance to us, I revolved and resolved to learn their language which in the course of a few months residence, I so far succeeded in acquiring as to be able, in general, to make myself well understood. I likewise tried to persuade Thompson to learn it as well as he might prove uh, to be necessary to him, but he refused saying that he hated both of them and their cursed lingo, as he would put it, and would have nothing to do with it. By pursuing this conciliatory plan, so far did I gain the goodwill of the savages, particularly the chiefs, that I scarcely ever failed experiencing kind treatment from them and was received with a great with a great deal of pleasure and a, and a smile of welcome at their houses where i was always sure of having something given me to eat whenever they had it and many a good meal have I had from them, when they themselves were short of provisions and suffering from want of them. And it was a common practice with me, when we had nothing to eat at home, which happened not unfrequently during my stay among them, to go around the village and on noticing a smoke from any of their houses which denoted that they were cooking either enter uh, in without ceremony I would and ask them for something that I might eat which was never refused. Few nations indeed are there so very rude and unfeeling whom constant mild treatment and attention to please will not mollify and obtain from them some return of kind attention. This, the treatment I receive from these people may exemplify. For not numerous, even among those calling themselves civilized, are there instances to be found of persons depriving themselves of food to give it to a stranger whenever or wherever may be his merits? It may perhaps be as well in this place to give a description of Nutka, the land of Nutka. Some accounts of the tribes who were accustomed to visit us 
and end the manners and customs of the people, as far as I hitherto had an opportunity of observing them. The village of Nootka is situated between 49 and 50 degrees north latitude at the bottom of Friendly Cove on the west or the northwest side. It consists of about 20 houses of huts on a small hill which rises with a gentle ascent from the shore. Friendly Cove, which affords good and secure anchorage for ships, close in with the shore is a small harbor, if of not more than a quarter of a mile or half a mile in length, and about three quarters broad, formed by the line of the coast on the east, and a long point or headland which extends as much as three leagues into the sound in nearly a westerly direction. This, as well as I can judge from what I have seen of it, is in general from one of two miles in breadth, and mostly a rocky, unproductive soil with but few trees. The eastern and western shores of this harbor are steep and in many parts rocky. The trees grow quite to the water's edge, but the bottom to the north and northwest is a fine sandy beach of about half a mile or more in extent. And from the village to the north and northeast extends a plain, the soil of which is very excellent and with proper cultivation may be made to produce almost any of our European vegetables. This is but little more than half a mile in breadth and is determined terminated by the sea coast which in this place is lined with rocks and reefs and cannot be approached by ships. The coast in the neighborhood of Nutka is in general low, but a little broken into hills and valleys. The soil is good, well covered with fine forests of pine, spruce, beech, and other trees, and abounds with streams of the finest water, the general appearance being the same for many miles around. The village is situated on the ground occupied by the Spaniards when they kept a garrison here. The foundations of the church and the governor's house are yet visible and a few European plants are still to be found, which continue to be self-propagated, such as onions, peas, and turnips, but the two last are quite small, particularly the turnips, which afford us nothing but tops for eating. <coughs> Their former village stood on the same spot, but the Spaniards Finding it a commodious situation, demolished the houses and forced the inhabitants to retire five or six miles into the country with great sorrow. And Makina told me, as Makina told me, did they find themselves controlled compelled to quit their ancient place of residence, but with equal joy did they repossess themselves of it when the Spanish garrison was expelled by the English. The houses, as I have observed, are above twenty in number, built nearly in a line. These are of different sizes according to the rank or quality of the chiefs who live in them, each having one 
of which he is considered to be the Lord. The, they vary not much in width, being usually from 36 to 40 feet wide, but are of very different lengths. That of the king, which is much the longest, being about 150 feet, while the smallest, which contain only two families, do not exceed 40 feet in length. The house of the king is also distinguished from the others by being higher. Their method of building is as follows. They erect on the ground two very large posts at such a distance apart as is intended for the length of the house. On these, which are of equal height and are hollowed out at the upper end, they lay a large spar for the ridge pole of the building. Or if, or, or if the length of the house requires it, two or more, supporting their ends by similar upright posts. These spars are sometimes of an almost incredible size, having myself measured one in Makina's house, which I found to be 100 feet long and 8 feet 4 inches in circumference. At equal distances from these two posts, two others are placed on each side to form the width of the building and these are rather shorter than the first, and on them are laid in like manner spars, but of a smaller size, having the upper part hewed flat with a narrow ridge on the outer side to support the, the ends of the planks. The roof is formed of pine planks of a broad edge, so as to lap well over each other. And they are laid lengthwise from the ridge pole to the center and to the beams at the sides, after which the top is covered with planks of eight feet broad, which form a kind of covering projecting so far over the ends of the planks that form the roof as completely to exclude the rain. Of these they lay large stones to prevent their being disposed by the wind. And the ends of the planks are not secured to the beams on which they are laid by any fastening. So that in a high storm, I have often known all the men obliged to turn out and go upon the roof to prevent them from being blown off, carrying large stones and pieces of rock with them to secure the boards, all with stripping themselves naked on these occasions, whatever may be the severity of the nether of the weather, to prevent their garments from being wet and muddied, and so these storms are almost always accompanied by heavy rains. The sides of their houses are much more open and exposed to the weather. This proceeds from their not being so easily made close to the roof, being built with planks of about ten feet long and four or five feet wide, which they place between them on stanchions or small posts of the height of the roof. These planks or boards which they make use of for building their houses and for other uses, they procure of different lengths as occasion requires by splitting them out with hard wooden wedges from the pine logs and afterwards dubbing them down with their chisels with much patience. Uh, to the thickness wanted and rendering them quite smooth. There is what one entrance, and this is placed usually at the end, though sometimes in the middle, as was that of the chief's house. Through the middle of the building 
from one end of the other runs a passage of about eight or nine feet broad, on each side of which the several families that occupy it live, each having its particular fireplace, but without any kind of wall or separation to mark their respective limits, the chief having his apartment at the upper end and the next in rank opposite on the other side. They have no other floor than the ground. The fireplace, or hearth, consists of a number of stones loosely put together, but they are wholly without a chimney, nor is there any opening left in the roof. But whenever a fire is made, the plank immediately over it is thrust aside by means of a pole to, to give vent to the smoke. The height of the houses in general, from the ground to the center of the roof, comes and does not exceed ten feet, and that of Makinas was not far from fourteen feet. The spar forming the ridge poles of the latter were painted red and black with circles alternately by the way of ornament, and the large posts that supported it had their tops curiously wrought or carved so as to represent human heads of a monstrous size which were painted in their manner. These were not, however, considered as objects of adoration, but merely as ornaments. The furniture of these people is very simple and consists only of boxes in which they put their clothes, their furs, and such things as they had almost all valuable, tubs for keeping their provisions of spawn and blubber in are separate, and trays from which they eat, and baskets for their dried fish and other purposes, and bags made of bark matting of which they also make their beds, spreading a piece of it upon the ground when they lie down, and using no other bed covering than their garments. The boxes are of pine, with a top that shuts over, and instead of nails or pegs, they are fastened with flexible twigs, and they are extremely smooth and high polished, and sometimes ornamented with rows of very small white shells. The tubs are of a square form, secured in the like manner, and of various sizes, some being extremely large, having seen them that were six feet long and four feet broad and five deep. The trays are hollowed out with their chisels from a solid block of wood, and the baskets and mats are made from the bark of trees. From this they likewise make the cloth for their garments in the following manner. A quantity of this bark is taken and put into fresh water, where it is kept for a fortnight to give it time to completely soften. It is then taken out and beaten upon a plank with an instrument made of bone or some very hard wood, having grooves or hollows on one side of it, taking care being to keep the mass constantly moistened with water in order to separate with more ease the hard and woody from the soft and fibrous parts, which, when completed, they parcel out into skeins, like thread, and these they lay in the air to bleach, and afterwards dye them black or red as suits their fancies, their natural color being a pale yellow. In order to form the cloth, the women 
by whom the whole of this process is performed, take a certain number of these skeins and twist them together by rolling them with their hands upon their knees into hard rolls which are afterwards connected by means of a strong thread made for the purpose. Their dress usually consists of but a single garment, which is a loose cloak or mantle, and is in one piece, reaching nearly to the feet. This is tied loosely over the right or left shoulder, so, so as to leave the arms at full liberty. These are the dress of the women, of course. Those of the common people are painted red with ochre the better to keep out the rain, but the chiefs wear them of their native color, which is a pale yellow, ornamenting them with borders of the sea otter skin, or a kind of gray cloth made of the hair of some animal which they procure from tribes to the south. Or, or their own cloth wrought or painted with various figures in red or black representing men's heads, the sun and moon, fish and animals which are frequently executed with much skill. They have also a girdle of the same kind for securing this mantle, ornamented and serves them to wear their daggers and knives in. The winter, however, in the winter, however, they sometimes make use of an additional garment, which is a kind of hood with a hole in it for the purpose of admitting the head and falls over the breast and back as low as the shoulders. This is bordered both at top and bottom with fur and is never worn except when they go out. The garments of the women are not essentially of those of the men, the mantle having holes in it for the purpose of admitting, admitting the, the arms and being tied close under the chin instead of over the shoulder. The chiefs have also mantles of sea otter skin, but these are only put upon ordinary occasions, and one that is made from the skin of a certain large animal, which is brought from the south by the, uh, the tribes to the south. This they prepare by dressing it in warm water and scraping off the hair and what flesh adheres to it carefully with mussel shells and spreading it out in the sun to dry on a wooden frame so as to preserve the shape. When dressed in this manner, it becomes perfectly white and as pliable as the best deer's leather, but almost as thick again. They then paint it in different figures with such paints as they usually employ in decorating their persons. These figures mostly represent human heads, canoes, uh, employed in, in catching whales and such like, and the skin is called memelth and is probably got from an animal of the moose kind. It is highly prized by these people and is their great war dress and, and only worn when they wish to make the best possible display of themselves. Strips or bands of it painted as above are also sometimes used by them for girdles or the bordering of their cloaks and also for bracelets and ankle ornaments by some of the inferior class. On their heads <coughs> when, they <coughs> when they go out upon an excursion particularly by going for whales or fish they wear a kind of cap or bonnet in form not unlike a large sugar loaf with the top cut off. This is made of the same materials with their cloth, 
but it is in generally of a closer texture and by way of a tassel has a long strip of the skin tied to it covered with rows of small white shells or beads. Those won by the Corbin people are painted entirely red, the chief having their de theirs of different colors. The one worn by the king and which serves to designate him from all the others is longer and broader at the bottom. The top, instead of being flat, having upon it an ornament in the figure of a small urn. It is also of a much finer texture than the others and are plated or wrought in thick black and white stripes with the representation in front of a, in the front of a canoe in pursuit of a whale with the harpooner standing in the prow to strike such is the picture upon the bonnet of these people their mode of living is very simple their food consisting almost wholly of fish or fish spawn fresh or dried the blubber of the whale or the sea or the sea cow mussels and clams and bear various of kinds of berries all of which are eaten with a profusion of oil for the sauce and not accepting even the most delicate fruit such as strawberries and raspberries with so little variety in their food no great can be expected in their cookery of this indeed they may be said to know but two methods by boiling and steaming and even the the latter is not very frequently practiced by them the, their mode of boiling is as follows into one of their tubs they pour water sufficient to cook the quantity of provision wanted a number of heated stones are then put in to make it boil and then when the salmon or other fish are put in without any preparation then sometimes cutting off the heads tails and fins the boiling in the meantime being kept up by the application of the hot stones after which it is left to cook until the whole is nearly reduced to one mass it is then taken out and distributed in trays in a similar manner they cook their blubber and spawn smoked or dried fish and in fine almost everything they eat when they cook the, their fish by steam which are usually the heads tails and fins of the salmon cod and halibut a large fire is kindled upon which they place a bed of stones which when the wood is burnt down become perfectly heated layers of green leaves or pine boughs are then placed upon the stones and the fish and the clams etc being laid upon them water is poured over them and the whole closely covered with mats to keep in the steam this is much the best mode of cooking and clams and mussels done in this manner are really ex excellent these as i have said may be considered as their only kinds of cookery though i have in very few instances known them to dress the roe or spawn of the salmon and the herring when they first are taken in a different manner this was by roasting them the former being supported being two between two split pieces of pine and the other having a sharp stick run through it with one end fixed to the ground the sprats are also roasted by them 
in this way. Uh, a number being spitted on one stick, and this kind of food with a little salt would be found no contemptible eating even to a European. At their meals they seat themselves upon the ground, with their feet curled up under them around their trays, which are generally about three feet long by one board and from six to eight inches deep. In eating, they make use of nothing but their fingers, except for the soup or oil, which they ladle out with clam shells. Around one of these trays, from four to six persons will seat themselves, constantly dipping in their fingers or all the clam shells one after the other. The king and chiefs alone have separate trays from which no one is permitted to eat with them except the queen or principal wife of the chief or chiefs. And whenever the king or one of the chiefs wishes to distinguish any of his people with a special mark of favor on these occasions, he calls him and gives him some of the choice bits from his tray. The slaves eat at the same time and of the same provisions, faring in this respect as well as their masters, being seated with the family and only feeding from separate trays. Whenever a feast is given, by the uh, by the king or any of the chiefs, there is a person who acts as a master of ceremonies and whose business is to receive the guests as they enter the house and point out to them their respective seats which is regulated with great punctiliousness as regards rank, the king occupying the highest or the seat of honor, his son or brother sitting next him, and so on with the chiefs according to their quality, the private persons belonging to the same family being always placed together to prevent any confusion. The women are seldom invited to their feasts, and only at those times when a general invitation is given to the village. As whenever they cook, they always calculate to have an abundance for all the guests, a provision in this respect being considered as the highest luxury. Much more is usually set before them than they can eat. That which is left in the king's tray, he sends to his house for his family and by one of his slaves. As to the chiefs, theirs, who, those who eat from the tray, are the same tray, who are generally belonging to the same family, take it home as a common stock. Each one receives his portion, which is distributed on the spot. This custom appeared very singular to my companion and myself, and it was a most awkward thing for us at first to have to lug home with us in our hands or arms the blubber or fish that we received at these times. But we soon became reconciled to it and were very glad of an opportunity to do it. In point of personal appearance, the people of Nootka are among the best looking of any of the tribes that I have seen. The men are in general from about five feet to six feet five inches in height and remarkably straight of a good form, robust and strong with their limbs in general well turned and proportioned excepting the legs and the feet, which are clumsy 
and ill-formed, no, owing to no doubt, their practice of sitting on them, though I have seen instances in which they were very well shaped. This defect is more particularly apparent in the women, who are for the most part of the time within doors, and constantly sitting while employed in their cooking and other occupations. And the only instance of deformity that I saw among them was a man of dwarfish stature. He was 30 years old and but three feet three inches high. He had, however, no other defect than this diminutive size. Being well made and as strong and able to bear fatigue as what they were in general. Their complexion, when freed from the paint and oil with which their skins are generally covered, is a brown, somewhat inclined to a copper cast. The shapes of the face are oval, the features are tolerably regular, and the lips being thin, and the teeth very white and even. Their eyes are black, but rather small, and the nose pretty well formed, being neither flat nor very prominent. Their hair is black, long and coarse, and but they have no beard, completely extirpating it, as well as the hair from their bodies meaning Makina being the only exception who suffered his beard to grow on his upper lip in the manner of mustachios, which was considered as a mark of dignity. As to the women, they are much whiter, many of them not being darker than those in some of the southern parts of Europe. They are in general very well looking and quite handsome, some of them. Makena's favorite wife, in particular, who was a, a Wiccaminish princess, would be considered as a beautiful woman in any country. She was uncommonly well formed, tall, and of a majestic appearance. Her skin remarkably fair for one of these people with considerable color her features handsome, and her eyes black, soft, and languishing. Her hair was very long, thick and black, as is that of the females in general, which is much softer than that of the men. In this they take much pride, frequently oily and plating it carefully into two broad plates, tying the ends with a strip of cloth, of the of the country and letting it hang down before on either side of the face. The women keep their garments much neater and cleaner than the men. They are extremely modest in their deportment and dress, and their mantle, which is longer than that of the men, reaching quite to their feet and completely enveloping them, being tied close under the chin and bound with a girdle of the same cloth, or sea otter skin, around their waists. It is also loose sleeves, which they have to reach to their elbows. Though fond of ornamenting their persons, they are by no means so partial to paint as the men, merely coloring their eyebrows black and drawing a bright red strip from each corner of the mouth towards the, 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 towards the ear. The ornaments consist chiefly of ear rings, necklaces, bracelets, and rings for the fingers and ankles and small nose jewels. The latter are, however, wholly confined to the wives of the kings or chiefs. These are principally made out of copper or brass, highly polished, and of various forms and sizes. The nose jewel is usually a small white shell or bead 
suspended upon a thread. The wives of the common people frequently wear bracelets and ankle rings, its strips of the country cloth or skin painted in figures, and these of the king are principally chief bracelets and necklaces consisting of a number of strings of an article much prized by them, which makes a very handsome appearance. This, as they term it, is a kind of shell of dazzling whiteness and as smooth as ivory. It is of a cylindrical form and in a slight degree curved, about the size of a goose quill, and hollow. These, these inches of length are three inches or more and gradually tapering to a point which is broken off by the natives as it is taken from the water. This they afterwards string upon threads of bark and, and sell it by the length. It forms a kind of circulating medium among these nations, five fathoms being considered as the price of a slave, their most valuable species of property and their mode of taking it has been described to me. To one end of a pole, they fasten a piece of plank in which a considerable number of pine pegs are inserted and made sharp at the ends above the plank in order to sink it. A stone or some weight is tied and the other end of the pole suspended to a long rope. This is let down perpendicularly by the length of fissures in those places where that substance is found. They are usually from 60 to 50 fathoms deep. On finding the bottom, they raise the pole up a few feet and let it fall. This they repeat a number of times as if sounding, and when they draw it up and take off the, the ice straw which is found adhering to the points, their method of pure procuring it is very laborious and fatiguing, especially as they seldom take more than two or three of these shells at a time, and frequently none. Though the women, as I have said, make but little use of paint, they very reverse in this case with the men. In decorating their heads and faces, they place their principal pride, and none of our most fashionable bows are, when preparing for a grand ball, can be more particular. For I have known Makina to have been employed for more than an hour in painting his face, rub the whole off, and recommence the operation anew when it did not entirely please him. The manner in which they paint themselves frequently varies according to the occasion, but it oftener is their mere dictate of whim. The most usual method is to paint the eyebrows black in the form of a half moon and the face red in small squares with the arms and legs and part of the body red. Sometimes half one of the face is painted red in squares and the other black, and the others dotted with red spots, or red and black instead of squares, with a variety of other devices, such as painting one half of the face and body red and the other black. But a method of painting which they sometimes employed, and which they were much more particular in, was by laying on the face a quantity of bear's grease of about one-eighth of an inch thick. This they raised up into ridges resembling a small bead in a joiner's work with a stick prepared for the purpose and then painted them red, which gives the face a very regular appearance. Now on extraordinary occasions, the king and principal chiefs used to strew over their faces after painting a fine black shining powder 
procured from some mineral, as Makina told me it was got from the rocks, and they called it pletha, and value it highly, as in their opinion it serves to set off their looks to a great advantage, glittering especially in the sun, like silver. The article is brought then by bags of those who are living near to them, a very savage nation who live a long way uh, uh, to the north from whom they likewise receive a superior kind of red paint, a species of very fine and rich ochre which they hold in much estimation. Notwithstanding this custom of painting themselves, they make it invariable practice both in summer and winter, to bathe once a day and sometimes oftener. But as the paint is put on with oil, it is not much discomposed thereby. And whenever they wish to wash it off, they repair to some piece of fresh water and scour themselves with sand or rushes. In dressing their heads on occasion of a festival or visit, they are as full as particular as almost as long in the painting of their bodies. Their hair, after being well oiled, is carefully gathered upon the top of the head and secured by a piece of pine or spruce bough with the green leaves still upon it. After having it properly fixed in this manner, the king and principal chiefs used to strew all over it the white down obtained from a species of large brown eagle which abounds on this coast and which they are very particular in arranging so as not to have a single feather out of place occasionally wetting the hair to make it adhere. This together with the bow, which is sometimes of considerable size, and struck over with feathers by means of turpentine, gives them a very singular and grotesque appearance, which they however think very becoming. And the first thing they do on learning the arrival of strangers is to go and decorate themselves in this manner. The men also wear bracelets of painted leather or copper and large earrings of the latter, but the ornament on which they appear to set the most value is the nose jewel. Uh, in, of such application and may be given to the wooden stick with some of them an employ of this purpose. The kings and chiefs, however, wear them of a different form, being either small pieces of polished copper or brass, of which I made many for them in the shape of hearts and diamonds or a twisted conical shell about half an inch in length of a bluish color and very bright which is brought from the cell. These are suspended by small wires or strings into the hole in the gristle of the nose which is formed in infancy by boring it with a Pin, the whole being afterwards enlarged by the repeated insertion of wooden pegs of an increasing size uh, until it becomes about the, the diameter of a pipe stem, though some of them have a size nearly sufficient to admit the little finger. The common class who can readily procure, cannot readily procure the, the more expensive jewels that I have mentioned, substitute for them usually a smooth round stick, some of which are of the most incredible length, 
for I have seen them projecting not less than eight or nine inches be beyond the face on each side. This is made or fasted by securing in its place little wedges on either side of it. These sprit sail yard fellows, as my messmate used to call them, when they rigged out in this manner, made quite a strange show, and it was his delight whenever he saw one of them coming towards us with an air of consequence proportioned to the length of his stick to put his hand suddenly as he was passing him so as to strike the stick in order, as he said, to brace him up sharp to the wind. This used to make them very angry, but nothing was more remote from Thompson's ideas than to wish to cultivate their favor. The natives of Nutka appear to have but little inclination for cleanse, or, 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 or some of them to chase. They were expert marksmen and used sometimes to shoot ducks and geese, but the seal and the sea otter form the principal objects of their hunting, particularly the latter. Of this animal, so noted for its valuable skin, the following description may not be uninteresting. The sea otter is nearly five feet in length, exclusive of the tail, which is about 12 inches, and is very thick and broad where it joins the body and gradually tapers to the end, which is tipped with white. The color of the rest is a shiny, silky black, with the exception of a broad white stripe on the top of the head. Nothing can be more beautiful than one of these animals when seen swimming, especially when on the lookout for any object. At each time, it raises its head quite above the surface, and the contrast between the shining black and the white, together with its sharp ears and a long tuft of hair rising from the middle of its forehead, which look like three small horns, render it quite a novel and attractive object. They are in general very tame, near before they dive. I was told, however, that they are become much more shy since they have been accustomed to shoot them with muskets than they used to with arrows. The skin is held in great estimation in China, more especially that of the tail, the fur of which is finer and closer set than that on the body, which is always cut off and sold separately by the natives. The value of a skin is determined by its size, that being considered as a prime skin, which will reach in length from a man's chin to his feet. The food of the sea otter is fish which is a very dexterous in taking of it, being an excellent swimmer with feet webbed like those of a goose, and they appear to be wholly confined to the sea coast, at least to the salt water. They have usually three or four young at a time, but I know not how often they breed, nor in what places they deposit their young, though I have frequently seen them swimming around the mother when no larger than uh, they are of rats. The flesh is eaten by the natives, cooked in their usual mode by boiling, uh, and they are far preferable to that of the seal, which they make much account of. But if not in great hunters, these are, these are people more expert in fishing. 
Their lines are generally made from the sinew of the whale and are extremely strong. For the hook, they usually make use of a straight piece of hard wood in the lower part of which is inserted and well secured with thread or whale sinew a bit of bone made very sharp at the point and bearded. But I used to make home hooks for them of iron, from which they preferred, not only as being less liable to break, but more certain of securing the fish. Cod and halibut and other sea fish were not only caught by them with hooks, but even the salmon. To take this latter fish, they practice the following method. One person seats himself in a small canoe, baiting his hook with a sprat, which they are always careful to procure as fresh as possible, and fastens his line to the handle of the paddle. This, as he plies it in the water, keeps the fish in constant motion so as to give it the appearance of life, which the salmon seeing leaps at it and is instantly hooked, and by a sudden and dexterous motion of the paddle drawn on board. I have known some of the natives to take no less than eight or ten salmon of a morning in this manner, and have seen from twenty to thirty canoes at a time in friendly cove thus far and thus employed. They are likewise little less skillful in taking the whale. This they kill with a kind of javelin or harpoon, thus constructed and fitted. The barbs are formed of bone, which are sharpened on the outer side and hollowed within for the purpose of forming a socket for the staff. These are then secured firmly together with whale sinew, the point being fitted so as to receive a piece of muscle shell, which is ground to a very sharp edge and secured in its place by means of turpentine. To this head or prong is fastened a strong line of whale sinew about nine feet in length, to the end of which is tied a bark rope from fifty to sixty fathoms long, having from twenty to thirty seal skin floats or buoys attached to it at intervals in order to check the motion of the whale and obstruct his diving. In the socket of the harpoon, a staff or pole of about ten feet long, gradually tapering from the middle to each end, is placed, and this the harpooner holds in his hand in order to strike the whale, and immediately detaches it as soon as the fish is struck. The whale is considered as the king's fish, and no other person, when he is present, is permitted to touch him until the royal harpoon has first drawn his blood, however near he may approach, and it would be considered almost as a sacrilege for any of the common people to strike a whale before he is killed, particularly if any of the chiefs should be present. They also kill the porpoise and the sea cow with harpoons, but this inferior game is not interdicted by to the lower class, and with regard to their canoes, some of the handsomest are to be found on the whole coast as are made at Nootka, though very fine ones are brought by of the other tribes along the coast to the north and to the south, who have them more highly ornamented. They are of all sizes, from such as are capable of holding only one person 
to their largest war canoes, which will carry 40 men and are extremely light. Of these, the largest of any that I ever saw was one belonging to the chief, which I measured and found to be 42 feet 6 inches in length at the bottom and 46 feet from stem to stern. These are made of pine, hollowed out from a tree with their chisels only, and which are about three inches broad, these chisels, and sixth in length, and they set into a handle of very hard wood. This instrument was formerly made of flint or some hard stone ground to as sharp an edge as possible, but since they have learned the use of iron, they have almost all of them of that metal. Instead of a mallet for striking this chisel, they make use of a small round stone, which they hold in the palm of the hand. With this same awkward instrument, they not only excavate their canoes and trays and smooth their plank, but cut down such trees as they want, either for building, fuel, or other purposes, or the, a labor which is mostly done by their slaves. The falling of trees as practiced by them is, is a slow and most tedious process, three of them being generally from two to three days in cutting down a large one, yet so attached were they to their own method that notwithstanding they saw Thompson frequently with one of our axes, of which there were a number saved, fell a tree in less time than they could have gone round it with their chisels, still they could not be persuaded to make use of them. After hollowing out their canoes, which they do very neatly, they fashion the outside and slightly burn it for the purpose of removing any splinters or small points that might obstruct its passage through the water, after which they rub it over thoroughly with rushes or coarse mats in order to smooth it. Not only will it render it almost as smooth as glass, but forms a better security for it from the weather. This operation of burning and rubbing down the bottoms of their canoes is practiced as often as they acquire any considerable degree of roughness from use. The outside, by this means, becomes quite black, and to complete their work, they paint the inside of a bright red with ochre or some other similar substance. The prows and sterns are almost always ornamented with figures of ducks or some kind of bird, the former being so fashioned as to represent the head and the latter the tail. These are separate press pieces taken from the canoe and are fastened to it with small flexible twigs or bark cord. Some of these canoes, particularly those employed in whaling, which will hold about 10 men, are ornamented within about two inches below of the gunwale, with two parallel lines on each side of the very small white shells running fore and aft, which is a very pretty effect. Their war canoes have no ornament of this kind, but are painted on the outside with figures in white chalk representing eagles and whales and human heads, etc. They are very dexterous in the use of their paddles, which are very neatly wrought and are five feet long with a short handle and a blade seven inches broad in the middle and tapered to a very sharp point. With these, they will make a canoe skim very swiftly on the water 
with scarcely any noise, while they keep time to the stroke of the paddle with their songs. With regard to these, they have a number of which they sing on various occasions, at war, whaling and fishing, and at their marriages and feasts, and at public festivals or solemnities. The language of the most of these appears to be very different in many respects from that used in their common conversation, which leads me to believe either that they have a very different mode of expressing themselves in poetry, or that they borrow their songs from their neighbors, and what the more particularly induces me to the latter opinion is that whenever any of the, the Nechemas, a people from the north and who speak a very different language, they arrive, they used to tell me that they expected a new song and were almost always sure to have one. Their times are generally soft and their timing as well. Their tunes are also soft and plaintive, and though not possessing great variety, are not deficient in harmony. Their singing is generally accompanied with several rude kinds of instrumental music, among the most prominent of which is a kind of drum. This is nothing more than a long plank hollowed out on one end and underside and made quite thin, which is beat upon by a stick of about a foot long and renders a sound not unlike the beating on the head of an empty cask, but much louder. But to the most favorite instruments are the rattle and the pipe or whistle. These are, however, only used by the king, the chiefs, or some particular persons. The former is made of dried skill sin, so as to represent a fish, and is filled with a number of small, smooth pebbles and has a short handle and is painted red. The whistle is made of bone and generally the leg of a deer. It is short but emits a very shrill sound. And they have likewise another kind of music which they make use of in dancing in the manner of castanets. This is produced by a number of mussel or cockle shells tied together and shaken to a kind of tune, which is accompanied with the voice. Their slaves, as I have observed, form their most valuable species of property. These are of both sexes, being either captives taken by themselves in war or purchased from the neighboring tribes who reside in the same house and form, as it were, part of the family and are usually kindly treated and eat of the same food and live as well as their masters. They are compelled, however, at times to labor severely, as not only all the men menial offices are performed by them, such as bringing water and cutting wood and a variety of others, but they are obliged to make the canoes, to assist in building and repairing the houses, and to supply their masters with fish, and to attend them to war and to fight for them. None but the king and the chief have slaves. The common people being prevented from holding them, either from their inability to purchase them 
or, as I am rather inclined to think, from its being considered as a privilege of the former alone to have them, especially as all those made prisoners in war belong either to the king or the chiefs who have captured them, each one holding such as have been taken by himself or his slaves. There is probably, however, some little distinction in favor of the king, who is always the commander of the expedition. As Makina had nearly 50 male and female in his house, a number constituting about one half of its inhabitants, comprehending those obtained by war and by purchase, whereas none of the other chiefs had more than twelve. The females are employed principally in manufacturing cloth, in cooking and collecting berries, etc. With regard to food and living in general, they have not much a harder lot than their mistresses. The principal difference consisting in these poor unfortunate creatures being considered as free to anyone, their masters prostituting them whenever they think proper or wherever they think proper for the purpose of gain. In this way, many of them are brought on board the ships and offered to the crews, from whence an opinion appears to have been formed by some of our navigators injurious to the chastity of their females, that which nothing can be more generally untrue, and is perhaps in no parts of the world is that virtue more prized. The houses at Nutka, as already stated, are about twenty, with com without comprising those inhabited by the other small tribe that has been conquered and incorporated into that of the Nutka, although they must be considered as in a state of vassalage, as they are not permitted to have any chiefs among them, and live by themselves in a cluster of small houses at a little distance from the village. The Nutka tribe, which consists of about 500 warriors, is not only more numerous than almost any of the neighboring tribes, but far exceeds them in the strength and martial spirit of its people. And the fact, and in fact, there are but few nations within a hundred miles, either to the north or the south, but are considered as tributary toward them. In giving some account of the tribes that were accustomed to visit these people, I shall commence at the southward with one tribe and at the, the Wikiminish they are called, promising that in the point of some personal appearance there prevails a wonderful diversity between the various tribes on the coast, with the exception of the feet and the legs which are badly shaped in almost all of them from their practice of sitting on them. This one tribe are a numerous and powerful one. They live nearly 300 miles to the south and are said to consist of more than a thousand warriors. They appear to be more civilized than any of the others, being better and more neatly dressed more mild and affable in their manners, and remarkable for their sprightliness and vivacity, and celebrated for their singing and dancing. They exhibit also great marks of improvement in whatever is wrought by them. Their canoes, though not superior to those of Nutka, in point of form and lightness, being more highly ornamented, and their weapons and tools of every kind have a much higher finish 
and display more skill in worksmanship. Their cast of countenance is very different from that of the Nootkeans, their faces being very broad, with a less prominent nose and smaller eyes, and the top of the head flattened as if it had been pressed down with a weight. Their complexion is also much fairer, and their stature shorter, though they are well formed and strongly set. They have a custom which appears to be peculiar to them, as I never observed it in any of the other tribes, which is to pluck out not only their beards, but the hair from their bodies, but also their eyebrows, so as not to leave a vestige remaining. They were also, in general, more skillful in painting and decorating themselves, and I have seen some of them with no less than a dozen holes in each of their ears, to which were suspended strings of small beads, almost two inches in length. Their language is the same as that spoken at Nootka, their, uh, but their pronunciation is much more hoarse and guttural. These people are not only very expert in whaling, but are great hunters of the sea otter and other animals with which their country is said to abound, as the menelith, a large animal of the deer kind, the skin of which I have already spoken of, another of a light gray color with a very fine hair from which the manufacture of a handsome cloth, the beaver and a species of large wild cat or tiger cat are also sought as hunted among them. The Wikiminish, their neighbors on the north, are about 200 miles from Nootka. They are a strong and warlike people but considered by the Nutkins as their inferiors in courage. This tribe is more numerous than that of Nutka, amounting to between six and seven hundred warriors, though not so civilized as those to the south and less skillful in their manufactures. Like them, they employ themselves in hunting as well as in whaling and fishing. Their faces are broad, but less so than those to the north or the south, with a darker complexion and a much less open and pleasing expression of countenance, while their heads being present a very form and different form, being pressed at the sides and lengthened toward the top, somewhat in the shape of a sugar loaf. These people are very frequent visitors to Nootka, a close friendship subsisting between the two nations. Makina's queen being the daughter of the Wikmanish king. The Kowatas and joining them on the north are much less numerous and their force not exceeding 400 fighting men. They are also behind them in their arts of life. These are a fierce, bold, and enterprising people, and there were none that visited Nutka whom Makina used to be more on his guard against or viewed with so much suspicion. These Esquatis are about the same number, and they are considered to be a tributary to Makina. Their coast abounds with rivers and creeks and marshes, and to the north, the nearest tribe of any importance are the Artizatis. These, however, do not exceed 300 warriors, in appearance whom they are considered as tributary, their manners and dress and style of living being also very similar. They reside at about 40 miles distance up the Sound, and a considerable way further to the north are the Cayuquets, 
and these are a much more numerous tribe than that of Nootka, but brought by the latter to be deficient in courage and martial spirit. Makina, having frequently told me that their hearts were little like those of birds. There are also both at the north and the south many other intervening tribes, but in general small in number and insignificant, all of whom as well as the above mentioned speak the same language, but the newest class who come from a great way to the north and from some distance inland, as I was told by Makina, speak quite a different language, though it is well understood by those of Nutka. These were the most savage looking and ugly men that ever I saw, their complexion being much darker, their stature shorter, and their hair coarser than that of the other nations and their dress and appearance dirty in the extreme. They wear their beards long and have a very morose and surly countenance. Their usual dress is like a sack of wolf skin with a number of the tails attached to it, of which I have seen no less than ten on one garment hanging from the top to the bottom, though they sometimes wear a mantle of bark cloth of a much coarser texture than that of Nutka. The original under... The original that I would speak of as being under are of the color of, of which appears to be the same, although from their very filthiness it is almost impossible to discover what it had been. Their mode of dressing, their hair, as also varies essentially from that of the other tribes, for they suffer that on the back of the head to hang loose and bind the other over their foreheads in the manner of a fillet with a strip of their country cloth ornamented with small white shells. Their weapons are the chinook, the war club, which is made from whale bone, daggers and bows and arrows, and a kind of spear pointed with bone or copper, which they get from the traders. They brought with them no furs for sale, excepting a few wolf skins, their merchandise consisting principally of the black shining mineral called peplain and a fine red paint which they carefully kept in close mat bags, some small dried salmon, clams and rows of fish with occasionally a little coarse matting of cloth was all they sought to bring to trade. They were accustomed to remain a much longer time at Nutka than the other tribes, in order to recover from the fatigue of a long journey, part of which was over land, and on these occasions they taught their songs to our savages. The trade of most of the other tribes with Nutka was principally train oil, seal or whale's blubber with fresh fish or dried herring or salmon, clams and mussels, and the yama, a species of fruit which is pressed and dried, and cloth, and on that of the sea otter skins and slaves. Equa, the equities, they, they have furnished us with wild ducks and geese, and particularly the latter. The Wickaminish and the Klazanats brought to market many slaves, the best sea otter skins, great quantities of oil, whale sinew, and cakes of yama, highly ornamented canoes of red ochre, 
of an inferior quality to that obtained from the Nuches, but particularly the so much valued amelt, an excellent root, and this is the size of a small onion, but rather longer, being of a tapering form like a pear and of a brownish color. It is cooked by steam and is always brought in baskets ready prepared for eating and is in truth a very fine vegetable, being sweet, mealy, and of a most agreeable flavor. It was highly esteemed by the natives who used to eat it as they did everything else with train oil. From these they also received, though in no great quantity, a cloth manufactured by them from the fur already spoken of which feels like wool and is of a gray color, thought to be of the wolf or other. Many of the articles thus brought, particularly the provisions, were considered as presents or tributary offerings, but this must be viewed as little more than a nominal acknowledgement of superiority, as they rarely fail to get the full amount of the value of their presence. I have known 18 of the great tubs in which they keep their provisions filled with spawn brought in this way. On these occasions, a great feast is always made to which not only the strangers, but the whole village, men, women, and children are generally invited and I have seen five of the largest tubs employed at such time in cooking at the king's house. At these feasts they generally indulge in eating to excess, making up this in respect for their want of inebriating liquors, which they know no method of preparing in any form, and their only drink is water. Whenever they come to visit or trade, it was their general custom to stop a few miles distant and under the lee of some bluff or rock and rig themselves out in their best manner by painting and dressing their heads. On their first coming on shore, they were invited to eat by the king when they brought to him such articles as he wanted, after which the rest of the inhabitants were permitted to purchase, the strangers being careful to keep them in their canoes until sold under strict guard to prevent their being stolen, the disposition of these people for thieving being so great that it is necessary to keep a watchful eye upon them. This was their usual mode of traffic, but whenever they wished to purchase any particular object, as for instance a certain slave or some other thing of which they were very desirous, the canoe that came for this purpose would lie off at a little distance from the shore, and a kind of ambassador or representative of the king or chief by whom it was sent dressed in their best manner and with his head covered with the white down would rise and after making known the object of his mission in a pompous speech hold up the specimens of such articles as he was instructed to offer in payment and mentioning the number or quantity of each when if the bargain was completed completed, the exchange was immediately made. On their visits of traffic, this chief alone used to sleep on shore. This was generally at the house of the king or head chief, the others passing the night on board of their canoes, which was done not only for the preservation of their property, but because they were not permitted to remain on shore, lest they might excite some disturbance 
or commit depredations. All these people generally go armed. The common class wearing only a dagger suspended from their neck behind and sometimes thrust in their girdles. The chiefs, in addition to the dagger, carry the chilatoth, or war club, suspended in the same manner beneath their mantles. This, in the hands of a strong man, is a powerful weapon in the management of which some of the older chiefs are very dexterous. It is made from the bone of a whale and is very heavy. The blade is about 18 inches long and three broad till it approaches near a point where it expands to the breadth of four inches. In the middle, from whence it slopes off gradually to an edge on either side, it is from one to two inches in thickness. This blade is usually covered with figures of the sun and the moon and a man's head, etc., and the hilt, which is made to represent the head of a man or some animal, is curiously set with small white shells and as a band fastened to it in order to sling it over the shoulder. Some of the tribes have also a kind of spear headed with copper, again from the trading with those that come in ships as ourselves, or the bone of a stingray, which is a very dangerous weapon. This is, however, not usual and only carried by the chiefs. The bow and arrow are still used by a few, but since the introduction of firearms among them, this weapon has been mostly laid aside. But to return to our unhappy situation, though my comrade and myself fared as well and even better than we could have expected among these people, considering their customs and mode of living, yet our fears lest no ship should come to our release and that we should never more behold a Christian country were to us a source of constant pain. Our principal consolation in this gloomy state was to go on Sundays, whenever the weather would permit, to the borders of a freshwater pond about a mile from the village, where after bathing and put on, on clean clothes, we would seat ourselves under the shade of a beautiful pine while I read some chapters in the Bible and the prayers appointed by our church for the day, ending our devotions with a fervent prayer to the Almighty that would, design, would, would deign still to watch over and preserve our lives and rescue us from the hands of the savages and permit us once more to behold a Christian land. In this manner were the greater part of our Sundays passed at Nutka, and I felt grateful to heaven that amidst our other sufferings we were at least allowed the pleasure of offering up our devotions unmolested, for Makina, on my explaining to him as well as was in my power, the reason for our thus retiring at this time, far from objecting, he readily consented to it. The pond above mentioned was small, no more than a quarter of a mile in breadth and of no greater length, the water being very clear, though not of great depth, and bordered by a beautiful forest of pine, fern, elm and beech trees free from bushes and the underwood. A most delightful retreat, which was rendered still more attractive by a great number of birds that frequented it, particularly the hummingbird. 
and thither we used to go to wash our clothes and felt secure from any intrusion from the natives or other as they rarely visited it except for the purpose of cleansing themselves of their pain. Thank you.